Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, I was going to defer to the uh, the fellow chair if he had any questions beforehand. And I just wanted to to make sure that uh, we weren't bypassing the the chair. Uh, no, uh, thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Senator Wong. I'm uh, more than happy to uh, let others go first. If I have questions, I'll ask them uh, later. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I I, 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 I want to begin by thanking uh, Control Lalembo, and um, if I may, uh, compliment you for your long history of service to our state from the Office of Health Strategies, uh, not Health Strategies, a healthcare advocate to right now the controller, um, I, I think it's important for us as a state to acknowledge your um, service to our state. And, and I do believe that the goals that you articulated are very much the same for every legislator in the General Assembly. Um, and, and the goals for me, similar to yours, is to address the escalating cost of health insurance. Uh, the current status quo truly is unacceptable and unsustainable. And, and how can we help our residents and small businesses and nonprofits secure affordable health insurance to protect themselves and their loved ones? I, I think I'm eager to find out your perspective on Senate Bill 842. Having read your testimony, um, I, I like to take a look in, in regards to what would you consider to be the top three difference makers uh, that that um, would be a difference in, in reducing cost and increasing access and meeting the goals that I articulated. Thank you, Senator. I, I appreciate the, the question. And obviously I can only speak to, to my plan and those parts uh, that we are working on and I'm most familiar with. I don't wanna make believe that I am a, an expert in Medicaid uh, or in 1332 waivers. I, I am not, uh, so I will leave that aside. Uh, in the part that we're working on, the, the, the public option uh, for small businesses, nonprofits, and uh, the Taft-Hartley plans, I think the, the primary drivers of difference are the administrative costs that I've already mentioned, are the overall medical costs that we're managing that I've already mentioned. And the third would be, sort of we, we are not... Uh, a profit-making company. So we are not in this uh, to make money or to pass money on to our shareholders. We are representatives of the state um, and need to just take in enough premium uh, to reasonably pay out claims and have a little bit of reserve left over um, in case we hit a, a year of unexpected uh, turbulence. I'll focus on the cost of care just for a second, Senator, if I may. Um, we've often heard that it's not the cost of insurance that's the problem, it's the cost of healthcare. And I would say that's right and wrong. Um, it, it's right in that it is part of the problem, but it is in fact only part of the problem. I've been working in partnership with private companies and providers looking for innovative ways to lower costs. And we've been able to be I hate the visual, but the tip of the spear in this conversation. And I think in the moments of truth, if you ask the carriers, they like to watch us go in and negotiate um, because then they can sort of follow uh, behind. I always thought as a, a purchaser of health insurance uh, that the carriers, because of their the size of their book of business and their own self-interest, would always negotiate best practice and would always negotiate best costs. And that is simply not the case, as evidenced by the willingness of hospitals and large provider groups to negotiate directly with us on behalf of the members of our plan. So that is a significant difference. Um, and we can be responsive. Uh, to the needs of the enrolled, and we don't have to serve multiple masters. I, I appreciate that feedback, um, but as I was listening to you, I, I, I cannot help but think that um, as I talk to physicians and I talk to hospitals, uh, I, I always think the insurers do a darn good job because they're, they're not very well liked in regards to their uh, pressure and, and leverage, just as you articulated, 
that you are able to do under the partnership program. So I, I think it's it's not a lost art of negotiations that that is uh, pursued by all actors in trying to get economy and scale and cost efficiency. And it, I think that's part of the rationale that we have right now is the fact that our health insurers aren't always uh, thought of in the best light. Uh, but I also understand that they have a very, very hard job to do because the true cost of health care is not always understood. And, and the management of risk and the economics of health care is one that I have been aware of for over 30 years um, from my benefits background and, and also from studies of it because it's important. It's always been um, the, 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 you know, the, 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 the goal of everything that we try to do related to health care costs is try to contain it. But nevertheless, um, it continues to rise despite our best efforts to, to leverage and negotiate like you articulated. Um, I want to get to the economics and and um, and dive down a little bit in regards to SB 842 and how it's dramatically different. And for you to articulate that, uh, particularly as it relates to, um, let's go to section one, where you are going to include the Taft-Hartley coalition. But could you, for, for education purposes, explain to people what the Taft-Hartley coalition means and what you are looking to do under definition to incorporate them into the partnership uh, pooling that you're uh, proposing. Certainly, Senator, uh, and, and I agree, it is hard work. Um, I think uh, there, I'm just gonna go back to your reaction to my last comment, and that is uh, to say it, it is hard work. I didn't mean to say that the carriers are not doing it. I'm saying that sometimes uh, the different positions that we have give us an ability to negotiate um, in different ways. Um, and I don't mean as a government official, I just mean based on the book of business that we're doing. And that is evidenced by sort of the efficiency of the plan that is well documented. Um, so the Taft-Hartley plans um, are uh, the union plans. And I had a bit of misinformation about them for a long time. I just assumed that the Taft-Hartley plans because of their size or their association or because of their international or national footprint would have the heft uh, to negotiate um, uh, better contracts for themselves uh, in the market. And I've come to learn that that isn't always so. It is true for some, but not for others. And many operate just like small businesses in their ability to negotiate. And if you want to talk about a power differential, we talk about what it must be like for a small business to try to negotiate rates for themselves. It is impossible uh, to do. Um, so the Taft-Hartleys have asked if they could be part of uh, the group that would be, have access to the public option. Um, and it is included in 842, and I would welcome them to be part of it. And they are part of the coalition that's supporting the bill as well. So you asked that they have asked to participate. Um, is it is there a group coalition like we have in CBAC, or is it individual unions? Uh, having been a student of, of labor relations, I understand that uh, most of the Taft-Hartley coalition are, are predominantly craft unions. And uh, um, you're right, they, they don't have that economy of scale, but they also have a significant record of risk management and to, to uh, incorporate them into the partnership pooling with a broader pool uh, is going to be a, a, a dramatic change and an and exposure for them. So you, you said they have asked to, to join. Um, uh, can you cite a couple of particular unions that have articulated and made that request to you? Uh, I'll just say, Senator, that the Coalition of Taft-Hartley plans sits at the table in the coalition meetings, and then their membership is, you know, I'm sure they'd be happy to answer uh, who okay. is in their membership, but it is made up of SEIU and 1199 and UAW and individual unions, um, but they have a common interest uh, in policy setting across all of it. So the SEIU, as you just cited, is part of the Taft-Hartley coalition? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry, Senator, I misspoke. So it, it, SEIU is not part of the Taft-Hartley coalition? I don't believe so, no. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I do believe it's part of a, a kind of a, uh, it's a federal program. It's an umbrella coverage group uh, across employers. It, I, I found it even when my studies um, in the Labor Relations School of Cornell that uh, it was a very un interesting and, and uh, 
a, a, a part of our history that, that started from the labor movement. Um, number, uh, the second question I have relates to section two, which I find it interesting. Um, and I don't know if you have the, um, the bill language lines, but I'll, I'll just for a point in, in line 74, um, 73, uh, leading to possibly line 74 to 92, um, it, 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 it allows you as the controller, it allows you, but does not require you to address the, the rating factors that uh, small group private plans must use. And you do, and, and I think you articulated in your testimony and in your written one, that you are able to provide a rate guarantee of no more than 3% increase or decrease. Um, that, that's, that's impressive, I, I must say. I, and knowing the numbers and, and cost containment, to, to offer that kind of a rate guarantee is, is quite interesting. Uh, I, I am hopeful that you're able to accomplish it, but private insurance companies can't offer that guarantee, can they? I suppose they could offer whatever they would like, Senator. They do not, but can they? Sure. Now, that guarantee, um, do you have to provide that guarantee to the insurance department under this bill or under the statutory creation of this partnership? Are you regulated by the insurance department of the state of Connecticut? Senator, as the insurance committee probably knows better than anyone else, uh, self-insured plans are not regulated by the insurance department of any state. Uh, they operate under ERISA law, with federal, um, and in our case, there is a double layer. And for this population, it would obviously be subject to ERISA because they're not state employees or municipal employees. Um, and in addition to that, the Healthcare Cost Containment Committee, uh, which is a labor management uh, group, um, also uh, sort of oversees what we are doing uh, with, with the health plan and gives us that input that's necessary. So things around uh, state mandates uh, that come into play. I, I see there was some accusation yesterday that somehow I would decide you don't get something. Well, uh, the history uh, does not support that. Um, and so I think when we operate on the grounds of uh, absolute facts and not rhetoric, um, it is clear that our plan uh, right now and will continue to uh, operate within all both state and federal requirements for coverage, but is not regulated by the insurance department. Um, it is an important distinction and one that I would caution the committee um, to not violate uh, that wall between state and federally regulated because there are many large plans in the state of Connecticut that are self-insured um, that know where the regulation comes from and where it does not. The third party administrators in Connecticut who support and help us are our partners. They know where their regulation lives. And in some cases that does live at the insurance department. Um, and I know the committee would not suggest that the state get in the business of regulating self-insured plans. No, I, I, I really appreciate your answer on that. And, and, and it is important. Uh, in, in all my experience with you, as my compliment to you earlier on, um, you have been a tremendous public servant, and uh, the, uh, the, the state of Connecticut owes you a great uh, in debt of, of gratitude for your tremendous service. So no doubt, no doubt in, in, do I ever question or impugn your, your challenge, but I'm simply looking at the language as it's written and, and the, the execution of reading the language. And I just wanted to simply point out that, that this partnership and, and, and Control Lembo, you as an individual have the greatest of integrity, uh, but you will not be in that seat forever, uh, nor will any of us. And it's important that what we write down in statute uh, is fully vetted and, and articulated uh, to the legislative intent because it will impact many people's lives. So let me be clear. This is the partnership program is not regulated by the insurance department and, and it's intentional as you shared. And, and what I'm reading is that it does allow the controller to adjust the rate factors, but you really don't have to have the oversight of the insurance comp department uh, to protect what you may or may not do. I, I just want to point that out from a point of transparency. And I, I think you did point to a rhetoric uh, statement, um, and I'm going to go to line 67. I think it might have been referring to that 
through the partnership, the controller will have the power to approve or deny applicants. And I believe that's line 67. Now, I, I understand under the ACA, and one of the most important things that the ACA, the federal ACA, despite its many challenges, is the fact that pre-existing conditions and people at a high risk pool are guaranteed insurance and acceptance. But can you clarify what line 67 means? And I'm not saying you, but for any individual that may come after you, that the controller has the power to approve or deny applicants. Is that giving the controller the selectivity and potentially adverse selection in, in limiting the pool of applicants you have into the partnership program? So Senator, the, the, if I use the existing partnership now as an example, because the way we operate um, would continue uh, just that way with this new group, uh, we, we do not exclude based on pre-existing condition. Our underwriting criteria in this new plan would be limited to two factors, and that is geography and age, which is available across the small group market. The section that you're talking about um, is intentional. And frankly, without it, it would be horribly fiscally irresponsible uh, to pass the bill uh, without that language because there are bad actors uh, in our world, as we know. And when there is a plan, whether it's partnership or this new program, uh, where someone says has, for example, uh, 50 employees and 35 of them are uh, warehouse workers, um, and are in a position uh, to uh, be exposed to uh, physical risk uh, on, on a regular basis. And 10 are white collar accountants and billing folks, and five are the C-suite people, you know, the, the upper management of that company. If that company applied to this program uh, and just wanted to cover their 35 employees who work in the warehouse and not the others, it would put the state at a tremendous risk and allow them to wash bad risk through the program and therefore through uh, the state's uh, administration of this program and would not be fair to the others uh, that are participating in the program. So that is why that language is there, Senator. And if there is a way to more artfully uh, put bumper guards around that, uh, I know you know that I share your position um, that one monkey doesn't stop the show. And if I get hit by a CT transit bus or decide not to do this anymore, uh, someone else is going to have to do it. There may be some who are quietly cheering uh, for that to occur. Uh, don't get your hopes up, not anytime soon. Um, and you know what? I wish you a long life and 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 safety. Uh, and I, I, I mean it like a broken record. I, I, I really do greatly appreciate your service to our state. That being said, I think you hit the important part. Let me go back to, again, we share a common goal in being able to provide accessible and affordable insurance. And, and I think you said for you not to have that provision, it would be fiscally irresponsible. And I agree. But, you know, as I said earlier as well, our current insurance companies aren't on everybody's Christmas list or holiday list because they cannot selectively reject people. They may charge them a significantly higher rate. And that is part of the challenge that they have is the fact that they are regulated by our insurance department, one of the best in the country, if not in the world. We have actuarial risk managers and experience uh, being the insurance capital of the world of having some of the best companies and actuarial management in the world. Look, I can assure you every company Every insurance company, if they can reduce rates, they do in a heartbeat. It's a competitive advantage, as you have articulated in the partnership. But they have a fiscal responsibility to ensure that the policies that they sell, the insurer that they're providing, um, meet the financial responsibilities. That's what we're getting to is the escalating cost of health care is, is getting out of reach and unsustainable for many of our residents. We're trying to solve this problem, but but one of the biggest incentives for people to, 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 to gravitate toward the partnership program is the fact that they are able to get access, that, that they're able to provide in a cost-effective manner. 
but they also want to be able to know that they will be guaranteed insurance. And, and that provision of, of the ability to prove or deny applicants is counter to the idea of the ACA and counter to the philosophy that we should be providing insurance for everyone. Um, and I, I just wanted to point that out because you're right. There is always an economic cost and a fiscal responsibility aspect. And that isn't always a pleasant answer to people when they have to pay escalating premiums. But that cost of health care is incredibly high. Um, I'll, I'll move on. And, and the other part that I have, and, and, uh, and I want to thank the chair for the indulgence of the time in the question is, there is a lock-in requirement for individuals or or uh, nonprofits and and small businesses. The, the the opening of the partnership to those entities. Can you elaborate a little bit more of what the three-year lock-in for people that that kind of sign into the system, um, and also if they have a bad experience or are not getting the service or the, the 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 care or the the uh accessibility that they anticipated just in a free market basis they can leave what is the three-year lock-in and after that three-year lock-in what is the cost of exiting this partnership plan it, i believe that is vision line, that's a line um uh well it begins in a multiple section and if i may it, it, it's still part of section two, but it's it's maybe the lock-in for unions and nonprofits applies to 123, 124. Um, and also you're allowed to charge an administrative fee with no parameters. Um, that would be one line, 199 to 120. But but rather than me articulating it, I, I wanted to defer to you um, as an architect of this and, and better understand it. Thank you, Senator. So a couple of just quick points of clarification. Um, there's the, we're going to go back and say there's the cost of health care and the cost of insur health insurance, and those two things may or may not be the same. Um, so I want to make sure that we're clear as we talk about these things. The second is this idea uh, of, I'm going to call it cherry picking. You didn't use those words, but I think that was the inference um, and that the limitation uh, on some companies uh, under state regulation to do some of the things uh, that, that you articulated um, is not there because the regulator uh, makes sure that that doesn't happen. I would keep in mind the context as well, though, Senator, and that is there has been a long march of sales of uh, self-insured health insurance to very small, small businesses with wraparound excess loss policies and primary, the primary sales pitch um, of those. And, and I don't think anybody would suggest that a company that has 15 employees should ever be self-insured. But the motivation and the drive and the sales uh, shtick behind that is all around uh, get out from under Connecticut's regulation, get out from under the mandates and essentially offer what you would like. So that's already happening in the private sector. And if it's something that the committee wants to take on at some point in the future, I'd be happy to be uh, uh, helpful. You said that the administrative fee has no parameters around it. Uh, yes, because it's a direct reflection of what it costs me uh, to run a plan while not putting a burden on the taxpayer. And that could change incrementally over time. I don't know, you may have been, I have never been invited into the boardroom or the C-suite of the existing carriers when they're deciding what admin bump they need. Um, and so, you know, of course, you know, they don't guarantee. Uh, it's this whole idea as well that you hear whenever there's a, a, a mandate requirement or a taxation uh, question, the, the response is always, well, that's going to drive up premium. It never leads to, well, that's going to come out of our admin or that's going to come out of our hide. No, it's always about pushing that down to the consumer. So um, the three-year lock-in, Senator, is 
Um, back to that washing of bad risk, we are really focused in that section on the larger groups, um, and we don't want them coming in, washing risk, and then heading out the door um, the next year. So I would argue that in with free will and as an option, if someone reads that and is uncomfortable with the three-year lock-in, they don't want to engage in that, then they can move on. This is not an entitlement program we're talking about here. We're talking about an option in addition to the other options that exist in the market. And and so it is a three-year lock-in, and uh, I do agree with free choice. And uh, for those that, that look to exit, are there uh, uh, administrative charges to exit out? Um, Senator, I forgot, I didn't say at the beginning uh, that I'm joined by uh, Josh Wojcik, who's an assistant controller and our policy director, as well as Miriam Miller, who's our legislative liaison and a policy associate. Um, fingers to keys, these are the people who are writing language. I know you understand that because you guys have your own group of people with fingers oh, on keys. Oh, absolutely. Um, so uh, Josh from Miriam, uh, penalty for early leaving. How is that constructed, if at all? So that that language uh, that uh, Senator Wong that you're uh, uh, reading there is actually uh, directly from the existing uh, partnership um, program um, and 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 the statute that that currently exists. And uh, so within uh, the existing uh, partnership program, right there there is a a, a three year uh, requirement for participation. And in our agreement with uh, groups, there is a uh, a, a percentage of claims fee for leaving early, which reduces each year. So after the first year, um, I, I believe it's somewhere around 3%. I, I can get you the actual numbers, but it's, it's a low percentage of claims. Um, and then after year two, it's about half of that. And then after year three, it's zero, right? So there's no fee to leave uh, after the third year. So you could leave early, uh, but there's a charge to do so. Thank you for that explanation. Just uh, in light of the Zoom world that we're in, uh, if I could just make sure that you properly identify yourself, and uh, I believe um, uh, your your screen said Kevin Lembo. I just wanted to sure. make sure that um, we, yeah. we make note of the correction. So, yep, I'm uh, uh, Joshua Wojcik, and I'm an assistant comptroller. Thank you, Josh, and and thank you very much. Um, the, the the I only have two more questions, and and I think the other is to seek your expertise. Uh, controller is um, it, it also requires on, on A42 for, for the controller to procure services, including but not limited to those that are necessary to comply with ERISA, which is the Employee Retirement Income Security Act, which is a self-insured governmental plan, and, and to charge an assessment against the unions, nonprofits, and small employers. I'm referring to line 157, and uh, 152 to 161 for uh, charging it against unions, nonprofits, and, and small employers. Now, I, I remember in my work in the legislature and our municipalities, the ERISA experience and the requirements are very daunting and, and they can be very complex and costly. Um, can you make, can you explain the um, connection of what that statutory language intended as it relates to ERISA? Senator, I think what, what's happening here is that it, you are, we are, the language is breaking out the different pieces of what is really in that admin fee. And you're making the point for me. And that is there are pieces of this that cost money and those need to be borne by the sponsors slash participants in the plan. So the, the small, the nonprofits, the small businesses, the taft heart lease, they need to pay an equal share of those pieces, you know, versus us paying for it, which I don't know that anyone would suggest or is envisioning. Um, there are, you are correct, filings that need to take place under ERISA, and there are expert folks uh, who do that. We are not them. Uh, and so that, that adds to administrative cost. Um, but again, we're starting with a base of 2.3%. Um, compared to 15% in the private market, I've got a little bit of room here. So, um, you know, I don't know if we want to unpack the admin of you know, the carriers versus what we're suggesting on a side-by-side -side analysis. I'm happy to do that at any time. And and if I may, and, and I, I really do thank you for, for articulating that because 
that is the crux of it. I, I do believe that we all share, Democrats and Republicans, share a common goal to be able to uh, address uh, the, the escalating cost of health insurance and providing health care. But we also want to be able to be able to make it accessible to everyone. I believe that. I want that. Uh, I think that the, the approach is, do we approach it on a fiscally responsible one and a sustainable one moving forward? And the reason I am asking those questions is you articulated and demonstrated very clearly that the provisions of 842 does give the controller great latitude in, uh, in your ability to manage the cost, to, to be able to assess cost and fees, um, just as insurance companies do. And, 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 and again, as I said repeatedly, um, not always to the, to the favor of the consumer, but they have to be accountable to regulators, the, 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 the state insurance department. And, and my concern is right now, your integrity is 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 not impugned at all, but there will be other controllers and other individuals in that office. And the fact is, we're giving tremendous power, tremendous authority without a state insurance department oversight in, in regulating a significant financial endeavor. That being said, uh, I, I don't want to close by a letter that Senator Kelly and I sent to your office on February 3rd and received an acknowledgement, but never received any answers. So I will take you up on your offer to articulate some of the data points that uh, that goes into the current partnership system to really get a transparent audit of, of what is really uh, the financial picture of the current program. I'm going to read out loud that the letter that we sent to your office that we have not yet gotten a response uh, on February 3rd. Dear Control Lembo, we write to request the most recent information regarding the Partnership 2.0 plan. We are under the impression that you are seeking to expand participation in this plan through continued marketing to municipalities and that this plan will be similar in ways to your proposal of a public option. As a result, we are looking for the following information. One, the total premium received and total claims paid over the 2020 calendar year. Two, the total premium received and total claims paid over the 2020 calendar year per each municipal employer group. Number three, what are the loss ratios for 2019 and 2020? Number four, an explanation of the impact on the 2020 premiums as a result of the 2019 loss ratio and 2020. And number five, number six rather, uh, number five, your cost to administer the plan, both external and internal, including the fringe for 2019 and 2020. And what protection do you have in place for the general fund, e.g., stop loss insurance or reinsurance. Could you please explain to us also the shortfall in the state employee health services account and the retired state employee health services account identified in Secretary McCall's letter to you dated January 20th, 2021. As we understand the legislature may be asked to expand the partnership program this session and consider a public option we would greatly appreciate this information as soon as possible. Thank you. Sincerely, Senator Kevin Kelly, Senate Republican Leader, Senator Tony Huang, Deputy Senate Republican Leader and Ranking Member of the Insurance and Real Estate Committee. If you could, uh, uh, control the limbo, uh, be able to follow up with us and, and share um, the, the answers to those questions would be greatly appreciated. And I, I want to close and, and again thank the indulgence of the chairs on this is saying that um, as you said you've never been invited into the c-suite of insurance companies to debate their uh, machinations and strategies um, and I wish we could um, but I would also offer to you that as the ranking member on the insurance committee who is committed to finding solutions I haven't been invited to discussions about the public option and Senate Bill A42 uh, prior to this public hearing. So again, I hope we can all work together 
and find solutions that are sustainable and viable into the future because our goals are the same. We're just looking at different solutions that may benefit the people and the taxpayer of the state and create an insurance program that is going to be able to keep jobs and provide the necessary access for many of the residents that are clamoring for it. So uh, thank you for the indulgence, uh, Mr. Madam Chair and Mr. Chair. And I wanna thank you again, uh, Controller Lembo, for your service to our state. And I look forward to working with you as we move forward on this. Thank you, Madam Chair. Great, Senator, thank you. I, I appreciate that. Um, I, I assume sort of that, that was a question, what was contained in the letter, and I'd like to answer it for you so that the other members of the committee have the benefit of that response. Um, and I wanna thank you as well um, for you know being a partner where we could be partners and uh, agreeing to disagree where we couldn't be partners, um, but it's always been a pleasure working with you. And I agree, we, we all do share uh, the same goal. I hope that's true. I know that's true in your case. Um, and uh, my problem, however, is that I haven't seen a reasonable alternative. I haven't seen anything come forward that would really address in a comprehensive way uh, the problem that, in particular, our small employers, our nonprofits um, are facing. Um, the other thing I want to be clear about is that I don't think it is fair or accurate uh, to somehow equate regulated status with being under the insurance department only. Uh, there are multiple forms of regulation. ERISA is one of those. And federal plans, self-funded plans, fall under that regulation paradigm. And that is where this would fall as well. So it is regulated. It's just not regulated by the insurance department, but neither is the Pratt & Whitney plan, the EV plan, the pick a big employer plan, uh, they are all governed by uh, ERISA as well. And as far as I can tell, uh, doing, uh, doing pretty well. So uh, I did receive your letter on the third and if you check your inbox, you'll see that the answer is already there. Um, it, it came in uh, today. We worked very quickly and hard on a response to you out of respect uh, for the senators who sent that uh, letter. And since you did read the questions, I think it's fair and probably appropriate for the committee for them to hear me read the answers um, to your questions. On partnership, and I won't reread the questions which are artic articulated at the top of my response. As you can review in the attached documents, the Connecticut Partnership Plan took in more in premiums than it paid out in claims in 2020, whether measured on a fiscal or calendar year basis. The plan is also on pace to have a positive medical loss ratio again this fiscal year. A decrease in usage in the spring caused by COVID-19 pandemic has further reduced claims. However, the plan was already projected to have a positive MLR prior to the onset of the pandemic. A statutory change requested by my office and adopted in 2019 allows for regional rate adjustments in the partnership plan by county. Prior to that change, the plan was required to offer identical rates as the state employee plan and as a result experienced an MLR over 100% in fiscal year 2018 and 2019 as high enrollment of groups in Fairfield County where healthcare costs are higher proved higher than the large Hartford County-based state employee population. The premium impact on the state plan was 3.4% for the active plan and 0.8% for the pre-65 retirees. In the fiscal year 2020, those regional rate adjustments began to phase in, further stabilizing the plan and leading to an immediate improvement in the MLR. The rate adjustments are set now by county and will be fully implemented for fiscal year 2022. The partnership plan is now projected to run at an MLR under 100% for the foreseeable future, cementing its reputation as a market leading option for municipal and non-state government groups. As for stop loss, the current partnership plan statute requires the state and partnership plans to share risks meaning annual premium rates are set by reviewing the claims experience of both groups combined. The plan design allows other non-state public employees to enjoy the cost shaving, saving contractual and relationships and rate predictability 
that are made available due to the large size and resulting negotiating power of the state employee plan. My office provides the services of reviewing claims, engaging in procurement processes, and otherwise complying with applicable federal regulations associated with administering an employer-based health plan, resulting in lower administrative costs for enrolled partnership groups. Generally, groups that have joined the partnership plan did so because it provided a savings for the employer and improved benefits for the employees. The positive impact of that relationship extends to municipal taxpayers in the form of lower property taxes. Together, the state plan and the partnership plan now have 260,000 participants. With such a large pool of participants, stop-loss insurance is not recommended. The cost of stop-loss policies would vary, would very likely result more in premium paid by state and partnership groups than the benefits received, rendering it wasteful. Current statute does not contemplate the purchase of stop-loss, and I would strongly recommend against any requirement to purchase it in the future for these groups. As described above, the current financial state of the partnership plan is and is projected to be strong further reducing the need to purchase stop loss on behalf of the plan. On the budgetary status of the state health plan, in the latest letter dated January 20th, 2021 from OPM Secretary McCaw, the state health plan showed deficit relative to its general fund appropriation. Because the legislature adjourned due to the pandemic without adjusting the biennial budget, updated lapse targets recommended by my office OPM and the governor's office were not adopted. I'm pleased to report that since Secretary McCall's letter, the deficit for retiree health has, resol has resolved, while a $30 million deficiency remains in the active health plan and attachment is provided. It is important to note that the general fund appropriation for the state health plan is not a reflection of the cost of claims, but the cost of premiums collected from state agency budgets. Therefore, Despite a current fiscal year deficit, the plan has generated large reserves that can be used to drive general fund budget savings in fiscal years 22 and 23. Additionally, since October, budget estimates projecting a significant increase in Medicare advantage, my office was able to negotiate an extremely favorable contract renewal, 130 million for emphasis, below what was anticipated. Combined by applying the adjusted projections from Medicare contract and drawing down the reserves generated by premium collection, my office is forecasting in total $250 million in savings from the October estimates. To the Appropriations Committee members, you're welcome. In conclusion, <laughs> The state health plan continues to be a strong force in the healthcare industry. Innovative contractual relationships, such as a recent agreement with CBS that puts aggressive limits on administrative costs and secures best in the nation prices on brand and generic drugs are resulting in lower costs and better care for members, including all of us. By partnering with private sector companies from large insurers to healthcare startups, my office has been able to create jobs in Connecticut, create new models for reimbursement, such as the networks of distinction program that are being advertised by some of our local hospitals, and deliver world-class preventative care to protect the health of plan members, including municipal workers in the partnership plan. I'm incredibly proud of the work being done by my office and look forward to the opportunity to discuss this always in greater detail. Thank you, Control Lembo. And, and I, I must say that uh, I appreciate you reading it. And uh, given that my office received it at 1053, just before the hearing, I wasn't able to review it uh, because I was preparing for our committee public hearing. So I will read it in depth. And again, I am uh, uh, an open invitation and uh, a, a, a engage and renew uh, initiative to uh, collaborate and find solutions. So uh, I, I hope that we'll be speaking often uh, because as I said in the beginning, and I will end with this, we all have the same goals. 
and that is to, to, to provide the best and most affordable, most accessible quality health insurance uh, to Connecticut residents and small businesses and nonprofits. And I hope we can reach a compromise through the legislative body, through the controller, and through the executive branch to, to have a policy that we can all be very proud of and, and be sustainable into the future. And again, I, I really appreciate uh, my committee members and the chairs for the indulgence for the for the length in question. It has been very helpful for me and I, I, I appreciate it, Control Limbo. And I'm sure you're gonna get other questions as well. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Wong.